Perfect. Good evening, everyone. My name is Annie Benzi. I am the chair of the fellow subcommittee for SSAT for complex GI surgery. Welcome everyone here tonight for what is sure to be a great talk. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Daniela Molina. She is the director of the Esophageal Surgery Center at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City, as well as the president of the Society of Women Thoracic Surgeons. So definitely something to um, have a lot of experience in and speaking about this topic. Um, so without further ado, Dr. Molina, if you wouldn't mind just introducing our fellow and giving us some oversight um, on this evening's talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here. And uh, I look forward to a good discussion about a topic that is, is very complicated. And uh, uh, fortunately, I think we're going to have more and more issues in the future um, because of, um, you know, a lot of bariatric surgery that is going to be, that has been done in the, in the past 10 years and uh, 20 years. So, but I want to introduce our speaker tonight and, uh, it was really my pleasure to get to know her. Emily Luters is actually, uh, like me, um, trained in, um, in different countries. She is from Germany where she did her medical school. She was a little bit smarter than I because she came here for residency rather than going through all residency there and then do it again here. And uh, she's completed her general surgery residency in Indianapolis. Uh, and uh, now she is uh, doing a, a fellowship in uh, high um, uh, risk G high surgery uh, in Dallas uh, for um, with uh, Dr. Rohan Jerhaya and uh, his team. Uh, he's here with us tonight. So I, um, I, I think this is going to be a great discussion. I'd like to encourage everybody to ask questions in the chat. Um, this is really an opportunity for us to talk about issues and, you know, really brainstorm about what to do with these patients, because we were talking a minute ago that um, you know, there is nothing worse for anyone to not be able to eat and enjoy, you know, uh, eating and, and, and drinking because not only is um, mentally and, and a, a good thing and, and really a great contribution to happiness, but also is a social thing, you know, people that cannot go out to drink uh, and to eat with other fellows um, and friends, they really have a hard time, they feel isolated and lonely. So with no further ado, Emily, please go ahead and, and start your presentation. Yes, uh, thank you so much for the introduction, Dr. Molina. Um, I greatly appreciate, obviously, the opportunity to present here tonight. And our topic for the evening will be conduits for esophagectomy following bariatric surgery. Um, I am currently at Methodist Richardson, as we talked about here in Dallas, for a foregut surgery fellowship. Um, one sec. So disclosures, to get that out of the way, I have none. And to go over our um, course for the evening, we will start with a brief case presentation. From there, I want to talk about uh, available options for this particular patient. Then a little bit about patient selection and preparation needed for surgery for alternative conduits, about the technical challenges that come with choosing conduits outside of the stomach for esophageal replacement, and expected outcomes. And we will at the end talk about how this patient did after surgery. All right. So why this discussion? I do believe that it is important to recognize that bariatric surgery continues to be on the rise. Uh, we have an average of 70 uh, bariatric surgeries per 100,000 um, citizens. Um, we had about 150,000 sleeve procedures and 56,000 Renoir procedures in 2021. It is well known that um, especially sleeve procedures can lead to de novo GERD. And in some studies, it has been demonstrated that patients following sleeve uh, can develop even Barrett's esophagus. Esophageal cancer, the seventh most, can uh, most common cancer worldwide and the sixth mo most common cancer for uh, cancer-related mortality. We have noticed a 350% rise from the 70s to the 90s in esophageal cancer cases, mainly due to the rise of adenocarcinoma here in the Western world. Um, our patient, we will call her Mrs. CG, um, is a 58-year-old female that had a history of breast cancer and diet-controlled diabetes that then uh, developed um, 
concern for achalasia following a sleeve gastrectomy that was performed in 2018 for weight loss purposes. It is to note that the patient had a hiatal hernia repair with a cruel, um, cruel repair in 2019 following her sleeve gastrectomy. After this procedure, when she presented to our office, she was complaining of dysphagia and intolerance to mainly solid foods. She was able to swallow liquids, but had had significant weight loss. An EGD was performed at that point, and it was noted that she had significant narrowing of her proximal sleeve, and the GE junction actually appe appeared widely open. A manometry was done that showed an absent peristalsis of the esophagus. All swallows appeared failed. The LES basal pressure was about 4.6, which was considered normal. Um, and we decided to perform a revision in this patient to uh, get uh, esophagogygenostomy with a total gastrectomy, given the concern that her um, sleeve had uh, anatomical alterations that led to her significant dysphagia. Uh, just in brief, our esophagogygenostomy we did with a 25 millimeter EEA, EEA stapler um, in a esophagus to side jejunum fashion, and that was reinforced with some cushing sutures. Um, so that is how we revised this patient in 2019. Um, and I want to touch really briefly on reflux following sleeve gastrectomy. Um, this is an, um, an, a, a take from a retrospective propensity scare, uh, score match study that was comparing patients with primary laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy to patients with revisional laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy. Um, and this is looking at the outcomes of these patients. And I was particularly interested in here, new onset reflux, which was noted in up to 30% of the patients, no matter whether it was a primary or a revisional sleeve gastrectomy. And um, to note, only 4% of these patients actually ended up requiring operative revision. So GERD, a common problem after sleeve, but operative revision rarely needed. So our patient, following her esophagogygenostomy to address the problem of the narrowed sleeve, uh, did very well for four years. She was able to eat and she gained weight. Uh, her quality of life was much improved, but eventually she started to develop recurrent dysphagia. She presented back to our office and was stating that for the past six months, she had noted um, intermittent dysphagia mainly to solid foods. An upper GI was performed and uh, showed uh, some narrowing at the anastomosis. She had undergone some endoscopic dilations that led to very brief uh, symptomatic improvement, but no, no sustained uh, relief. Um, and on the left, we see an image here of a zephagram from a small bowel follow through. There was red pseudoachalasia appearance. And pseudoachalasia is something I wanted to touch on briefly too. It is. Um, more commonly seen in patients with malignancy at the GE junction that can appear like echolasia on barium esophagram or even manometry, but does not actually have the same pathophysiology as echolasia. So we don't see the primary neurodegeneration that is characteristic for echolasia. Can I can I interrupt? Can you can you go back Absolutely. there for a second? Yes. That's a, that's a interesting picture because I it's a uh, it's a little bit hard to to see you know what's happening at the diaphragm and I think that that what we see there is the candy cane of your roux um and it looks like the um efferent uh side of your roux is kind of stricture there and so that that's a little bit curious to um and maybe you have more information about the CT scan or endoscopy, uh, but it seems like most of the contrast goes on the candy cane end of that uh, roux. Is that how I interpret it correctly? Because sometimes when you see just one image, it's really hard to interpret a swallow study. Yes, um, so there was some concern, and, and I do remember that from uh, the radiology uh, interpretation, that there was a preferential filling of the candy cane in the roux. Um, and I have her CT coming up here, and I do think it is interesting to see too, though. Um, that Before you go on, Dr. Ludas, can I just ask Dr. Molina and the group, when you do convert these to a EJ, do you, for the gastric bypasses, I tend to leave the remnant stomach, 
but I was wondering what the group thought about this in a sleeve, because I typically do take out the remnant stomach in that case. But I was wondering, we actually have quite a few people on the call that you might be you that might be able to help also, Dr. Molina. So I know yep. Dr. Ross is uh, somebody who's really does a lot of this. So Sharona, when you do this, do you take out the remnant stomach after sleeve to EJ? Yes. Okay. But in the bypass, if you've got a strictured or leaking bypass, when you do an EJ, you leave the remnant stomach, right? Now, I usually don't do bariatrics. So I, I go to fix when it's I need to do a redo for a patient that had a bariatric operation in the Correct. past. Correct. So in that circumstance, though, where you've got a sleeve, I mean, where you've got a pouch complication from a ruined mycastric bypass and you have to go to an EJ, do you, you leave the remnant stomach, right? In that case. Uh, depends on how difficult the dissection was. Mm -hmm. In other words, some people that have it really, you know, plastered. So it really depends on how many operations they had before, because I yeah. do it all robotically nowadays. But yeah. usually, yes. Okay. Okay. You're talking yeah. about the pouch or are you talking about the remnant? The remnant stomach, the bypass yeah. stomach. So I always kind of, you know, Dr. Molina, I'm always thinking about you and the possibility of a conduit down the line. Exactly. And the <laughs> stomach. So. Don't take that stomach. It's great stomach. Yeah, but, but, but remember that the stomach is really not a great conduit because you took the gastroepiploics to my knowledge, right? No, no, no. The sleeve, I totally agree. But yes. in the bypass, in the bypass, um, the it stomach should be present. It, it it's should be present. totally fine to use. I mean, I've used it a few times yeah. after yeah, a, but the, but a ruined bypass, white acid bypass. Correct. Yeah. Bypass is not. I'm I, I'm more worried about the sleeve because that's the ones where I can't use anything. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, I agree a hundred percent. Okay. And and just to clarify, because this happened before Dr. Luders was on our service that's exactly right. That static image looks a little bit like that afferent limb is being filled. And I love the term candy cane because that's exactly what I use. Dr. Benzi can tell you because they always, new radiologists always call it a leak and it's not, it's just the candy cane. And yep. so uh, it was a little preferential filling, but Dr. Luders will go through what the endoscopic imaging looks like too. Okay. Um, so next for us, I actually have the CT and then we should get to the endoscopic findings and the CT, what I just wanted to def, uh, demonstrate here. And let me see now, obviously my plate is missing. Good. So we see a distended fluid filled esophagus in these images. And I'm sorry that it's uh, a little bit, um, uh, that it's stopping intermittently. Maybe I can play this again. So the esophagus definitely looks dilated here and fluid filled, um, but on endoscopy. So this is after an uh, admission because the patient did have significant weight loss and malnutrition, so she required hospital admission for that. But on endoscopy, we actually see that the e the EJ was widely patent, no stricture was noted in both limbs. So the candy cane and the efferent limb were actually uh, easily accessible. Um, to note, there was some moderate resistance at the upper esophageal sphincter during that endoscopy. It was not entirely clear whether that was due to intubation or intrinsic stricture, but it was dilated at that point. It was not the first upper esophageal dilation for this patient either. But, so, you know, you can see on your endoscopy there that your candy cane is quite dilated. And honestly, I'm, I'm obsessed about that candy cane because patient can have really severe symptoms and especially, you know, saliva catches in there and then they have this bad regurgitation or food in saliva. And you can see that your efferent loop there is a little narrow and maybe there were some issues with that that had caused the dilation of the candy cane, you know, because there was a little bit more, the stuff goes the way of less resistance. So if you have a little bit of stricture or some impediment to go down the efferent limb, uh, potentially, you know, your uh, candy cane has dilated for that reason. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah. And she was complaining of some nightly regurgitation. She also had a lot of odonophagia. That was a big part of her um, of her symptom complex at presentation. Quality of life was really pretty severely um, affected for this patient. And she was, so for a patient having undergone bariatric surgery, when I met her, her BMI was about 23. So she was definitely not overweight anymore. 
Um, I wanted to touch briefly again on pseudoachalasia secondary to bariatric surgery. And I found a study here or a case series that was uh, discussing uh, pseudoachalasia in four patients after different sort of bariatric procedures. So we have patients here that have undergone um, a Renoir. We have some with sleeve gastrectomy, vertical band gastroplasty, or biliopancreatic diversion. All of these patients, and this is a long-term outcome study, so up to five years following bariatric surgery, all these patients eventually presented with dysphagia and um, were suspected to have achalasia on initial manometry or barium esophagram. It was interesting to me that um, here it was noted that when they compared the what was thought to be uh, an elevated tone at the lower esophageal sphincter, when they um, assess the inversion point that they actually noted that the pressure zones were often distal to the lower esophageal sphincter, so more consistent with a complication related to, to the prior bariatric surgery. Um, only a handful of these, or only two of these patients actually required um, conversion to a ruin Y. The other two were managed with balloon dilation. Um, so definitely not an uncommon problem in the bariatric population. And I um, I want to touch briefly on pseudoachalasia imaging and manometry finding. Um, so on manometry, the findings can look uh, deceivingly similar to achalasia and similar on barium esophagram. I think it is very difficult to see that the high pressure zone is not the lower esophageus, lower esophageus sphincter itself, or that the high pressure is not caused by a failed relaxation of the sphincter, by, but by external uh, compression. Okay, so in summary for this patient, um, we were dealing with a patient that had intolerance to solid food, frequent emesis, it was uh, really impactful to her quality of life. Um, the patient was suffering from weight loss and um, overall she was desperately seeking intervention. Um, we had long discussions with her prior to offering an uh, operative intervention, given that she had some concern for generalized GI dysmotility with some um, colonic dysmotility. She also had the issues with the upper esophageal sphincter that were somewhat worrisome. And obviously, uh, revisionist surgery in this patient was, uh, was not going to be easy. So we had a very long preoperative uh, discussion with this patient about uh, what we were um, hoping to achieve and what risks she was willing to take for this. And I wanted to um, give this question to the audience. Um, what would treatment options be for this patient? And um, one may think medical options, but we already know even in patients with echolasia, these really hardly ever work. Endoscopic interventions, dilations had been tried in these patients and really did not um, sustain a symptomatic relief that was acceptable to the patient. And surgery-wise, short of esophagectomy, the only thing that would come to my mind would be jejunal feeding tube that could address the patient's malnutrition, but obviously not help with her very diminished quality of life. If I'm going to start a little bit the discussion here. You know, if we think about you made the comparison between achalasia, pseudoachalasia, in this case, uh, you know, the motility, the esophageal motility is never the issue, right? Unless you have a sigmoid shape esophagus that becomes, you know, the, you know, the, uh, a, a place where the food stays and uh, then you have better regurgitation and aspiration issues. But usually, you know, the obstruction that you have at the LES, that's the issue with achalasia. And once you relieve that obstruction, then the esophageal transit by gravity, it's not ideal, perfect, but usually it's enough for a patient to be able to eat. So that's what my question is here. You know, was your thoughts that it was an esophageal issue or was your thought that was mostly a rue issue? And, uh, um, and I'm, not, I'm not sure that the problem was with, but it seems like that the uh, area of the efferent rue somewhat strictures or maybe adhesions or something that because she was fine for several years so it definitely worked initially and then something happened but it seems mostly like there is an outflow up, um, issue um, rather than of course that cause and and worsen the esophageal motility because any dilated esophagus is going to be not functional 
Uh, but I wonder, you know, like if um, maybe just revising the rule in this situation would have been an option. Yeah. Um, I think we've got some uh, comments in the chat, Dr. Molina. Um, yeah. So I don't know if you want to ask the audience for this because um, I, I think it's it's important to get get all of the perspectives here. Yeah, Annie, I think you you say you can mm -hmm. ask uh, how to query the audience. I think it would be nice to hear what people think about this situation, what they would do. Perfect. Dr. Ibrahim, do you want to expand a little bit on your thoughts? So he chatted in, he would revise the EJ and do an end to side hand zone anastomosis in that case. And I guess my question is what in particular about doing it end to side um, would you prefer? My response is two. And then Dr. Jayaraja also asked, you know, is just revising that rule going to help enough? I guess my question, if you're gonna go through open laparotomy again for this patient, you know, do you think that revision of that one area is enough? And just my own two cents in this too, is that obviously there's a reason why that happened, right? So, you know, we always talk about how repeating the same thing over and over again without knowing the reason, what is the chance that that would get better? Um, then Dr. Med, how much more do we know about esophageal function, right? So did you think that in this patient, repeating hermanometry would have been a benefit um, I guess what I've noticed too, now that I actually watch the manometry and do it myself versus, you know, sending out is that so many patients have upper jaw esophageal sphincter, like their pressure is off the charts almost. And what I have learned through researching this is that a lot of those patients actually have receptive um, problems with relaxation because of their uncontrolled reflux. So as their esophagus is getting burnt out over years and years and years of trying to push through, their upper esophageal sphincter becomes so like contracted in a way. And I think that's actually what you may have been describing, Dr. Luters, in this patient. Because um, I've noticed that in my own patients, even after fixing their reflux, they continue to have that globus sensation in the upper esophagus. And that is something obviously that's very challenging to treat um, as well. So I guess, did you consider doing any kind of manometry um, or any other like en like in endoflip under endoscopy in a patient like this? And do you think that would have changed your management strategy? I, mean, I think yes. once you lost the motility, I mean, and I think that Amelie already had uh, um, stated at the beginning that her esophagus was already non, uh, she had no motility whatsoever, even before the gastrectomy was done. So it's really difficult to regain motility. My experience, I started as benign. I did a lot of manometries when I was in Italy and at San Francisco when I came to US for the first time. Once the esophagus is dilated, the motility is lost and it's really hard, I think, to regain. So I don't know if it would have given us any information. Uh, the anastomosis looked wide open on the endoscopy. So I don't think it was an anastomosis issue. I think the issue here was below distal to the anastomosis and definitely not at all helped by the fact that the patient had no motility. But um, let's maybe read some of the comments also on the chat here. So dilation was brought up too, and just to be devil's advocate, so dilation usually goes with stenting, right? So. Have you, anyone had any experience with that? And then endoflip was something that got brought up as well. Dr. Luters, continue. Yes. Um, so to endoflip, we had a uh, somewhat recent manometry in this patient, and um, she had 100% of her swallows were failed. She had an incomplete bolus clearance. The LES clearly was not the issue, but it was the immotility of the esophagus. So I think I would be um, in agreement with Dr. Molina there that her esophageal um, motility issue was in my mind severe enough that just a revision of the EJ would have probably not led to, or may have not led to um, symptom resolution. And she was, this was her third major abdominal operation in that area at the hiatus. So it was definitely not an easy operation. And we were trying to get the maximum benefit for that risk we were taking with reoperation in this patient. 
I think the other, you know, somebody suggesting about resecting the candy cane. Um, I think that uh, there are some endoscopic ways also to address the candy cane today. Um, some endosuturing um, can be done endoscopically. Uh, but I think that if you don't fix the afferent obstruction and the afferent limb, uh, probably the problem with the candy cane would have come back. So um, uh, it would have been nice to see a little bit more contrast going through to see what happened after it passed that area of stenosis there. But I don't, I don't, I don't know if just going in and you know such a big since she has so many operations already and just tried to resect a candy cane, it would have been a little, I don't know, it would have left me a little bit worried, you know, to do all that and then not obtain any improvement. So uh, just just to clarify, the scope went through very easily. Actually, contrast empties very easily, but as you saw, it tended to preferentially fill that little candy cane before going down but it goes down just fine. I think we have a question. Dr. Tavakoli. Hi, how are you? Great case. Um, yeah, I agree. This, these are difficult cases. We've, um, you know, what we've done in some of these cases where there's a candy cane and if there is a really clear, good history to suggest candy cane is the problem, we move to surgical resection. And by that history, I usually mean they eat or drink immediately afterwards, they report heavy gastric pain and they, they report relief of that pain if they vomit. Um, so if the history is clear and the length of the end, um, candy cane is long on endoscopic evaluation or if preferential filling, we actually go straight to resection. And we've had cases of patients who've been on TPN for a couple of years we go in and take the candy cane out and they're eating and drinking a week later. Um, but, but, but unfortunately, a lot of the patients are more complicated. They have a variety of symptoms. It's hard to know what, what is that. And that is the case, as um, Dr. Molina suggested, we do endoscopic, um, what I would call endoscopic testing. So we actually go and one of our GI partners, Chris Thompson, he's got a series of these now where we do endoscopic suturing to close it to see if it gives symptomatic improvement. And unfortunately, the endoscopic suture may or may not work long term. But then if it comes back, we've kind of done a trial test to see if it's um, to, see, to see if it's helpful. Yeah, that's that is very um, that's a very good idea, you know, to even test it, even if it's not a long-term solution, but then you know if that right. is it or if you need to do something more. And, and it's a really easy way to test it. Unfortunately. You need some skilled um, gastroenterologists or surgeons that do the suturing, and not everyone has that availability in every place. Molly, do you want to continue? Do you want to continue? Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for those interesting points. So uh, we have talked about this briefly already, but um, esophageal, esophageal conduit choices after bariatric surgery, for me, an interesting topic. So as we alluded to, the stomach is a viable option as long as the gastroepiploic arcade remains undisturbed. So that means in the standard rune Y bypass, the gastric remnant should still be able to be used. Sleeve gastrectomy, due to the uh, nature of the surgery, usually violates the gastroepiploic arch, and then the stomach is an unsuitable conduit, obviously. In vertical band of gastroplasty, it is dependent on if band removal would be easily feasible. So if you have a band erosion, that, to my understanding, would make the stomach much more difficult to use following vertical band of gastroplasty. Um, so hey, for let this... me comment on the, on the stomach, though, here, because it depends how high really you have to go, right? Because... Mm -hmm. Um, your sleeve can potentially be brought up in the chest uh, if it's a well-done sleeve, because sometimes I agree that these sleeves might have some areas of a little twisting uh, or makes it harder to do an anastomosis with the esophagus. It's, there are areas of narrowing within the sleeve itself, but you can get up, uh, you can get up in the chest, maybe at the level of the inferior vein, um, inferior pulmonary vein. Uh, so depending on what you're dealing with, if you have early stage cancer or something you cannot resect endoscopically, it's not definitive that it's not usable, but for the most part, uh, probably a sleeve is not usable. <laughs> 
you probably yes. are talking about Ivor Lewis because I don't think that would ever happen with a transiatal. Oh yeah, definitely. You have to do your nostrumosis in the chest yes. if you want to use the sleeve because um, it's never going to go above the, sure. you know, if you're lucky, maybe carina, but not even carina, to be honest, because you have a fixation point, but right? That is the duodenum. Yeah, but Dr. And, and the left gastric. Yeah, you've got to preserve. Well, I take the left gastric, you know, and the one that has no, the... And the one that's that a I, challenge, yeah. Because no, you need to remove those lymph nodes. I mean, I think that if you have a G-junction cancer, majority of the drainage is towards the left gastric. And so you don't want to leave the left gastric there and no, you want to remove that with all the- I agree hundred percent. What I was yeah, trying to like suggest- a super selective, Like you do, you used to do the super selective agotomy and preserve most of the stomach lesser curvature and just take all of the packet of lymph nodes. Exactly, but, but you have to take the last gastric, which they, just to in order to bring it up into the chest somewhat. Yeah, I'm 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 really confused though because if you take the left gastric and the sleeve is done appropriately, all you have is your right gastric. The right gastric oh, right. should be out. So but are you, you be, really relying on that? Because you'd be I, surprised. You'd be surprised because you have conditioning. Your stomach is conditioned. Depending how long ago your sleeve was done. Uh, your stomach is, uh, you know, I, we, we have used embolization I, in the, in the cases that I've used, I've embolized the left gastric because I also was afraid about not having a good um, uh, vascularization of the conduit, but I was surprised because most people that do the, the sleeve will keep a little bit of the gastroepiploic, right? So the gastroepiploic, the initial gastroepiploic is intact, and then you have the right gastric. And then you have that stomach that has been there maybe years, right? With this condition. And it's, uh, it's got a uh, submucosal, pretty good actually uh, perfusion that is conditioned by time. I, I, I would worry like uh, what Warren uh, mentioned only because it, it's all conditioned while you have the left gastrics. But once you take the left gastric, now it's a kind of a questionable whether it's in, it's going to survive in the chest. And then if you have a leak in the chest, I mean, it's a lot of risk that we're taking. So I agree, yeah. Ron. For me, it would have been more of a colonic conduit uh, with all those sleeves that uh, turn into cancer. Well, uh, you, you, I mean, I use ICG to to look at the con, the perfusion, so you can tell right away if the if your sleeve is perfused or not. I think it's the length more the issue rather than the perfusion. Uh, definitely, you know, you're tethered by the duodenum, and so there is not a lot of length that you can bring up. Yes, very interesting, definitely. Um, so we talked extensively with this patient and ultimately the treatment decision was made to proceed with an esophagectomy with the right colon interposition. We talked with this patient, we talked about her upper esophageal component to her dysphagia, also about her concern for a bit of colonic dysmotility. And given her, um, uh, her symptom severity, she decided that she wanted to proceed um, and so for the preoperative preparation in these patients when colon interposition is uh, planned after esophagectomy. It is obviously important to do a detailed history and physical with the patient, get a personal family history regarding colon malignancy, dysphagia and GI dysmotility history. Uh, nutritional status, as we talked about, this patient had significant weight loss. She had been on TPN for a while to try to improve her nutrition, but given the upcoming major surgery, um, I think um, paying uh, attention to uh, nutritional optimization preoperatively is important. The patient had a recent colonoscopy. She had a history of a prior polypectomy a couple of years prior, but was uh, had a repeat colonoscopy that was clear. Um, most sources that I read recommend a bowel prep, and that is our um, technique too. So mechanical and antibiotic bowel prep has some... Um, uh, some evidence to reducing potentially anastomotic leak rate. And SMA and IMA angiogram are interesting to look at the um, arterial supply to the colon for planning. And that I have coming up here for our patient. Um, here on the right side, we have her SMA angiogram. And what we're seeing is a normal either colic and right colic and a middle colic that is bifurcated. It can maybe play it a second time. Um, IMA 
uh, angiogram was done too, and I think it's good to always have some alternative condo choices for um, to um, address changes that may occur intraoperatively changes to the plan. So I am a angiogram here, bifurcated left colic artery, otherwise a normal angiogram, no IMA stenosis. And very briefly, more for the trainees, uh, the relevant anatomy here, the right colon is typically dependent on supply from the midicolic artery, the iliocolic and the right colic um, get, get taken at their base. For the left colon as conduit, usually the ascending branch of the left colic artery with supply the conduit. So the marginal artery of Drummond has to be intact for, for these conduit choices. Um, the right colon, so an incorporation of the terminal ileum is possible. And I think this is interesting for pediatric surgeons in particular because it leads to a somewhat better size match to the pediatric cervical esophagus. Um, there is a thought that the ileocecal valve can prevent reflux too, but on the flip side, it may lead to worsening dysphagia, swallowing difficulties. Um, the angiogram that we talked about is so important, especially for the right colon as conduit, because only about 70% of patients have the typical anatomy with the iliocolic, right colic, and midicolic. 30% uh, of patients have some sort of aberrant anatomy that needs to be known prior to surgery. Um, technical points here. Um, so first step is uh, uh, mobilization of the hepatic flexure, then um, the right colon gets freed. Um, along the white line of toad, then um, the right colic and the iliocolic get identified at the base and a clamp test is done. And then there are different techniques to assess the blood flow to the right colon following clamp test. Uh, some rely on palpation, otherwise Doppler or, um, or um, SPI-FI technique can be used to see whether the conduit is appropriately supplied. Um, Vascular compromise often though happens not just because of poor arterial inflow, but also because of venous insufficiency and thrombosis, similar to what we know from other uh, um, flaps. Um, the problem can be magnified by bacterial contamination of the colon. Um, and I think that is what makes the antibiotic bowel prep in particular interesting. Uh, for left colon interposition, the arterial anatomy here has less uh, um, less uh, anatomical aberrancy than with the right colon. Um, the um, blood supply here, as we talked about, comes from the ascending branch of the left colic artery. Um, it begins with a clamp test of the midicolic artery. Um, it is important to dissect um, in the, um, with the midicolic artery to also dissect the midicolic vein and identify the junction uh, with the superior mesenteric vein and uh, pay attention to the gastroepiploic vein because in some patients, the gastroepiploic vein may join the midicolic vein and then um, you want to take the midicolic vein uh, distal to this junction. Okay, um, so right or left colon, that's the question. Um, both have their advantages, the right colon gets placed, uh, usually gets placed isoperistaltic. The left may too, but it's um, it's a little bit more tricky. The right colon, as we talked about, can have a built-in anti-reflux mechanism if you uh, use uh, part of the terminal ileum. Um, the right colon is more thin-walled, which can be problematic. And we have the vari variable anatomy of the right colic artery. Um, for the left colon, it is considered in adults a better size match for the native esophagus, and it may be easier to obtain adequate length, even though I got to say I was surprised with this right colon interposition. We had very generous length, even though we do cervical anastomoses. Um, some patients do lack the vascular arcade that connects the midicolic artery to the right colic artery. So in that case, obviously the right colon is not a suitable conduit choice. Um, and in patients that have an IMA stenosis, the left colon is not a suitable choice. Um, but otherwise there are just to a certain degree personal preferences. Conduit positioning. Um, so the conduit placement can be done in different, um, in different fashions. Um, we place, or we place the conduit in this patient in the posterior mediastinum. Uh, some institutions prefer a substernal placement and a subcutaneous placement is possible as well. Um, so in order to decide on the conduit uh, position, I wanted to go over the advantages to each um, 
The posterior mediastinum is in most studies associated with a lower leak rate, sometimes statistically significant in other studies, it's more of an association. Um, it is still a feasible route in patients that have had, for example, cabbage or prior cardiac surgery of other nature. And the nice part is, I think it shortens operative time because no additional dissection is needed. Substernal or retrosternal route can be done as a stage procedure, for example, in patients with severe caustic injuries of the esophagus. In some studies, I read that there is a shorter conduit length associated with that, but um, that seemed to be uh, somewhat a point of discussion, and maybe there's some experience here in the audience on that. Um, I think the substernal route becomes um, in particular interesting if postoperative radiation is planned, because the substernal conduit is, uh, is somewhat outside of the field of radiation, which can, um, can be advantageous. Um, one study I looked at found an improved short-term uh, quality of life score in these patients with substernal placement. Um, it is necessary, though, if the conduit gets placed substernally to widen the thoracic inlet, and that can be done by a resection of the hemimanubrium or a portion of the left clavicle just to widen that inlet for the anastomosis. Um, Yes, the septicemia route, I think, is more of a fallback option for patients in for in whom, for whatever reason, reason the posterior mediastinum or the substernal route are not available. Uh, cosmetic outcome is not very desirable, and it is very a, a fairly long conduit is needed, so it's not as attractive of a choice in my mind. Um, this is a retrospective review that was looking at patients that underwent esophagectomy between 1988 and 2014 with a gastric conduit. There was no colon conduit patients in this collective. Uh, 33 patients here had a substernal uh, placement of the conduit and 180 a posterior mediastinal. Um, all were done with cervical anastomosis. Um, the substernal route was primarily chosen in patients with a benign pathology, why the posterior mediastinal route was more common in patients with uh, surgery for uh, cancer. Um, and the substernal route here was also done in a delayed fashion in 16 patients after prior diversion. 30-day um, and 90-day mortality was not statistically significantly different. And um, what was noted is that an ischemic conduit is more common in the retrosternal route at 3% than in the posterior mediastinal route. Reoperation was also needed in 21% of the patients with the retrosternal route compared to 8.8 with the posterior mediastinal route. And the posterior mediastinal route had uh, significantly less fewer respiratory complications. And a slight trend towards fewer anastomotic leaks, even though in this study with a P of 0 0.09, it was not statistically significant. Um, I want to look a little bit further into that topic and found a meta-analysis that looked at six randomized controlled triads with 190 posterior mediastinal placements, 170 retrosternal uh, case of 169, uh, 12 co case controlled trials, and at the uh, National uh, Collective Database from Japan that included 3,478 cases of posterior mediastinal placement and 6,300 6, places of retrosternal uh, placement. And um, in this, so a fairly significant amount of patients that uh, um, were accounted for here, in this study, mortality was not significantly different, but anastom anastomotic leak rate, sorry, was actually significantly less common in pa patients with posterior mediastinal placement. Um, they uh, theorized that it is probably based on tension and compression of the blood flow in the retrosternal route that the anastomotic leak rate goes up slightly. Okay, just to break you for a second, Emily, we have some questions Thank in the you. chat. So left versus right colon. I guess my question is, does your approach different, different, you know, are you doing an anastomosis in the neck versus an anastomosis in the chest too? I think that's something um, to like note in those questions. Um, another question, how many colon interpositions do you usually do per year? And does everyone resect manubrium if you're going substernal? I can maybe address the first two questions. Um, I have a slide coming up to our institution's experience with colon interposition. Um, I found five patients in our database for the past 10 years, so not a terribly common procedure. Um, and the left versus the right colon. 
So we uh, perform primarily cervical anastomosis, so a little bit longer of a conduit is needed, as we talked about before. And uh, the right colon, in our experience, seems to reach typically fine. Um, I think one benefit to the right colon over the left colon that I didn't mention in the prior slide is too that if the patient has diverticular disease, the left colon is typically more affected than the right colon. I was just saying in the chat that I often just use a transverse uh, colon because you know you can really take up to the right uh, hepatic flexure and, uh, um, uh, and you can get a really good length because some people's transverse is very long actually. A lot of that depends on the bifurcation, on the anatomy, I'd say the right middle colic because sometimes the right middle colic, you know, would uh, split pretty high towards the colon site, the intestine site, and it so you can kind of clamp it at the base easily. But sometimes the bifurcation is very low uh, into the mesentery, and and uh, you have to be very careful about because you you lose the perfusion. So I think that's very important to to be careful about the anatomy. And I actually use I don't know what you guys think about if you use any system in the operating room to make sure that your uh, conduit is actually well perfused. I, I use um, ICG routinely in the operating room for this operation and Bulldog to, to close the vessels that I think I want to resect and then do ICG to ensure that the colon is well perfused before I actually divide the vessel. So I'm not sure what, what's, what's your technique if anybody want to comment on that. Dr. Molina, I'm just wondering that's a large percentage of colons. That's 10% of your esophagectomy volume. Is there a reason you favor colon in that many patients? Oh, no, it's not. These are not usually our, um, these are not routine esophagectomies. So patients that um, uh, we do the colon usually either in patient that had, you know, the sleeve or patient that had a fail esophagectomy somewhere else. They just need a reconstruction. So they're not just routine esophagectomies uh, when we use the colon. So the routine, we do about 100 routine esophagectomies and then uh, other complex resection, uh, either due to you know fail resections at other hospitals or reconstruction for other reasons uh, or people that have, unfortunately we do now we see a fair amount of sleeves. I think that they, they, I'm, I'm a little nervous, you know, when the, the floodgate will open up with all these sleeves coming up because it's going to take 10, 20 years to develop cancer on this patient out of sleeve. And does anyone supercharge middle colic for left colons? It's often not needed, but you could definitely do it if you, once you transpose, you'll have ischemia of the tip, especially if you are doing a substernal um, a reconstruction because all your vessels are there, right? So it's easier. It's a lot more complicated if you're doing uh, a chest anastomosis or, you know, if you put your conduit in the posterior mediastinal route because the access to the vessel is a little bit more complicated. So I think if you're thinking about supercharging, then probably easier to go substernal. And I do agree with resection of the manubrium because you can have really bad um, dysphagia if you leave the manubrium in place and your inlet is pretty narrow there, depending on how big the graft is. Um, for the substernal route, do you do a blunt dissection? Uh, yeah. What do you mean, sternotomy versus blunt? Yes, yeah. I read the most most institution, I think, favor blunt dissection for the substernal route, right? Yeah. Unless somebody had a sternotomy in the past uh, or cardiac surgery or any other reason why you would want to do a sternotomy, I just do a substernal um, blunt dissection. Uh, and then just bring up the conduit and the graft. Great. Thank you. Um, so the technique we chose for this patient was a transhiatal esophagectomy with a cervical anastomosis. We decided on the right colon interposition. Given her prior surgery, we went straight to an open approach. And I don't know if anybody in the audience would have uh, started with a minimally invasive uh, procedure, but 
uh, she's had prior hiatus dissection, she's had multiple prior uh, abdominal surgery, so we went to an open approach. Her left liver mobilization was very difficult and very scarred in, probably from her hiatus hernia repair. And um, regarding the assessment of vascularity after clem try, we used spirally technique on top of palpation of the marginal artery, and that showed a pretty pretty decent blood supply. We did have some concern about the tip of the cecum; it looked just uh, slightly iffy, so that was resected, and the conduit length was still much uh, was still generous. Um, these are her, this is her post-operative barium swallow, uh, so no uh, contrast extravasation is seen, no outlet obstruction was noted, and the proximal anastomosis is nice and intact. I do want to talk briefly about jejunal conduits, uh, another option in patients that do not have a, a stomach suitable as conduit anymore. Um, I like the um, possibility or the option of using an indicator flap. I think that is a nice uh, nice way of having an idea of an impeding ischemic conduit. Um, it is noticeable, though, that for a jejunal conduit, it is necessary to straighten the conduit after resection. So that is done by opening the mesentery up to the serosa border of the jejunum so that you can have a straight and not a like C-shaped conduit. Um, it, there are some studies that do claim that uh, following jejunal conduit, the uh, re-intervention rate is slightly lower than if uh, colon conduit is used, may, maybe because of less redundancy of the conduit, um, but the data on that is not very uh, sturdy. Uh, supercharging is commonly done for jejunal conduits, and that may improve the blood supply in particular to the superior third of the conduit. Um, you can use either the internal thoracic artery and vein or the external carotid and jugular vein for that. Um, and the jejunum can also be used as free graft in those settings. And I don't know if it's a significant uh, benefit truly, but no bowel prep is required. Truly though, I think if I uh, were to take a patient to the operating room for a jejunal conduit, I would probably still bowel prep the patient in case the jejunum for whatever reason does not look favorable and the colon is supposed to be used. Just for, for the fellows though, uh, in the call, you really cannot transpose a jejunum all the way to the neck. I mean, mm -hmm. it, uh, it's, 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 I would say, assume that you cannot transpose the jejunum up to the neck unless you supercharge because mm -hmm. um, the furling of the mesentery would never allow you to bring it all the way up, all the way up that far. You can definitely do, you can take the second and the third um, uh, arteries and kind of straighten a little bit and obtain a long view uh, that, that you can bring into the chest. And I've done several patients now, you know, with this pretty extensive cancer that we do now in, involving the entire stomach and part of the distal esophagus, you can go to the level of carina pretty easy um, with the with the, with a well prepared roux where you uh, uh, you know divide some of the uh, uh, of the 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 arteries uh, that comes from the mesentery, but it's impossible to go all the way to the neck without supercharging because you have to really completely cut the mesentery in the middle, open up the proximal uh, loop of the, um, the small intestine is perfused by your graft at the neck. And then the distal portion of your jejunal conduit remain perfused by the mesentery artery. So it's, um, it's something to keep in mind that you really need to have plastic surgery on board here and a good program for plastic surgery um, microanastomosis if you want to go this route. Thank you. Um, yes, so I think the jejunum remains interesting in patients that, for example, have had prior colon cancer. I think in those patients, it may be a good choice, but it does have um, a couple downsides. So vascularity, more tenuous, as we discussed, so supercharging needed. Uh, the diameter tends to be smaller. There is an association with a higher cervical anastomotic leak rate, which is probably related to poor blood supply or uh, borderline ischemia. And um, just by needing the supercharging, it adds significant length and obviously uh, increases the complication rate for um, for these cases. Mucocutaneous flap reconstruction, I want to touch on just very briefly. Um, I think it is mainly used 
as a way to salvage conduits with areas of ischemia. And obviously there are some choices between sternocleidomastoid to pectoralis to fasciocutaneous flaps from the arm and the thigh that can be used, but none of these really are very attractive options because the rate of post-operative stenosis and stricturing is very high in these patients. Um, there is no good study data. This is really based on case reports only in patients that have had uh, very complicated post-operative courses that required these, these sort of uh, salvage maneuvers. They're also very short distance that you can cover with these, right? So it's either it's routinely done in laryngectomy patients where you don't really have to go deep into the chest, uh, but you only have so far of a flap that you can use and definitely not able to go all the way, you know, from stomach or, or jejunum to, to neck with these flaps, but there are options. Yes, I read some cases about like a uh, focal necrosis and ischemia of like gastric conduits that were replaced with a mucocutaneous flap. And it's definitely very advanced. And I do think the outcomes are aren't very encouraging. It's an instant option to manage a difficult situation, but not, not the greatest choice or not the greatest uh, experience for the patient, probably. Um, the management of leaks. So esophageal leaks, of it, it depends fairly significantly on where the anastomosis is placed, whether we have an intrathoracic anastomosis or cervical anastomosis. And irregardless of whether it is a gastric conduit or colon conduit, the first step in a cervical leak is uh, an opening of uh, the suture line, the staples, and a wide drainage of that area. In some patients, that may be sufficient in itself. Antibiotic and antifungal coverage can be added. Um, Nutritional support, once again, very important in these patients, typically uh, TPN or trigenostomy tube feeds if a feeding tube is present. Um, there are endoscopic management options like um, endoscopic suturing, uh, endovac placement or um, stent over sponge techniques, clipping. Um, so various options out there with very interesting, um, interesting data that um, would definitely go beyond the scope of this discussion here today. Um, I think it is important to keep the management principles in general in mind. So closure coverage of the anastomotic defect is important. Uh, leak containment, so wide drainage or opening of the incisions, mediastinal drain placement in patients with intrathoracic leak, and obviously drainage of any surrounding fluid collections. Uh, any sort of leak that occurs in the post-operative period, no matter whether it's intrathoracic or in the neck, does increase the overall post-operative morbidity and mortality of these patients. Um, if it happens immediately post-operatively, operatively leaks are tech, uh, uh, related to technical errors. In the more delayed fashion, um, the cause of leaks may be more ischemia or infection. Mm. So expected outcomes, um, it is something I find important in my operative decision-making that I can give the patients uh, um, some information on what I would expect the long-term outcome of this management to be. Um, for colon interposition after esophagectomy or jejunal interposition for that manner, matter, that is difficult because we have little, um, little high-quality data regarding the long-term outcome for these patients. Um, our institutional experience here with colon interposition, as we alluded to prior, we have about five cases we looked at. No leak was noted compared to 12% leak rate that we have with transiatal esophagectomies with cervical anastomosis and gastric pull-up. Um, we have no 30 or 90-day mortality in either group, so either gastric pull-up or uh, colon conduit patients. Mean length of stay does tend to be longer in patients with colon interposition at 15 days but it is noticeable that we have an outlier here that stayed almost 90 days. So that definitely changed our mean. Um, two patients experienced a complication, Glavian Dindo, class three or above, one calothorax that did require thoracotomy and decortication, and one patient, actually the patient that inspired this presentation did require reintubation and um, prolonged uh, uh, mechanical ventilation. Um, 
in the long term follow up for these patients, I looked through our um, our clinic visits for these five patients. We had one diaphragmatic hernia that required repair, one incisional hernia at six months post op that was repaired, and one patient unfortunately um, experienced a mortality and nine month due to cancer progression. This patient's post-operative course. So immediately perioperatively, she did very well. Um, she was transferred um, to the ICU, extubated, uh, tolerated the procedure well, and was transferred to our uh, step-down unit. Um, on post-operative day four, she developed um, worsening respiratory failure and had to be readmitted to the ICU. It was noted at that point that she had a left pneumothorax, so chest tube was placed for that. Um, given her, mainly her work of breathing, a reintubation was required. Bronchoscopy was performed, samples were collected. There was concern for um, a hospital-acquired pneumonia, but all cultures remained ultimately negative. Um, she was treated with a course of steroids and antibiotics, um, and we performed a CT scan with oral contrast to assess for a leak, which was negative. Um, she was uh, on the vent for five days following her reintubation and was ultimately extubated and discharged home on post-operative day number 15, actually, sorry, I discharged a rehab facility. She was readmitted two weeks after that with a superficial side infection, and she had some issues with tolerance of a tube feeds that were leading to diarrhea. Um, that was, uh, we switched the formula of the tube feeds and then she tolerated them well. So complex patient and definitely patients that have, um, that have some uh, morbidity that uh, is not entirely uncommon in the post-operative course. Her long-term outcome, so she was one of the first patients I, um, I'm, uh, experience here during my fellowship and we have seen her now back for her two-month visit in uh, clinic and she has some persistent nausea and she does still require some nutritional support with jejunostomy tube feeds um, but overall she feels like her quality of life has improved and um, she is um, she is still satisfied with her decision to undergo this surgery. This patient did have chronic abdominal pain prior to the procedure and we discussed preoperatively that there is uh, a low expectation that esophagectomy would improve her chronic abdominal pain. She did experience a, uh, um, a significant improvement, though, in her uh, odonophagia. Yeah. So a couple of studies looking at the long-term outcomes for patients with um, jejunal or colon interposition following esophagectomy. This is a retrospective study here found um, that was looking at um, patients with jejunal interposition. And um, they called these patients and obtained um, with the European Organization for Research and Treatment of Cancer core quality life questionnaire. They obtained a quality of life assessment. Um, these patients were patients that had undergone esophagectomy either uh, with gastric or colon conduits um, for uh, um, cancer. And um, sorry, lost my point here a little bit. Yes, um, so ultimately all these patients needed jejunal interposition. Some of these were redo cases after they had conduit loss. Um, so they noted that they also had very similar to our experience, one mortality at seven months due to respiratory complications. Median stay was significantly longer with 46 days. Uh, three out of six patients required a re-intervention for leak and or for sepsis or reflux. So some of those are just um, um, TPN, for example, is um, considered here too as re-intervention, I think. And median follow-up was very long at six and a half years. Um, all the patients, and this is uh, um, multiple years out from surgery, were actually able to tolerate and enter a diet with no, uh, with no additional supplementation with tube feed. I think that is um, something that is um, important to communicate with patients that we have some expectation that in the long term, um, nutritional support will be entirely um, per mouth instead of via tube feeds. Emily, you mind just wrapping up? I just want to be respectful for everyone's time here. It's a great presentation. Yes. Sorry. Um, one more long term study, not, uh, not much different from the other. Um, let's see. 
I'm going to skip over this. So I think it is, um, as a final take home point, not uncommon that this patient requires some re-intervention. About 45% um, of patients following uh, colon or jejunal interposition after esophagectomy will require some form of uh, re-intervention, whether it be endoscopically or surgically. So um, a point on the long-term outcome for these patients. And if anybody would like to um, bring up some final points regarding what after this discussion their preferred choice of conduit would be and how they would address GI dysmotility and uh, dysphagia in patients after bariatric surgery, that would conclude our discussion for today. Well, I just wanna say, uh, congratulations, uh, Dr. Luders, with a really nice presentation, very difficult, complex case. I think it was fun discussion for everyone. Um, so I don't know if there is any other final comments since we're out of time. I just want to make sure that um, um, that we 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 have a uh, respect for everyone time. But that's so very much. very helpful. Good, excellent presentation, Dr. Luders, and thank you so much, Dr. Pro Dr. Molina, for being with us here tonight. Um, everyone, if you wouldn't mind just putting on your cameras for a second so I can take a picture, and Dr. Luders, do you mind unsharing your screen? Um, yes. Our next discussion will be about surgical telementoring. It's on December 11th, same time, same place. Um, so everyone, hold on one moment.